Okay, here we go. Uh, so, unit one, if we're going to cover all ten units, uh, is the colonial era. Uh, we're going to talk about the colonies today first, and then we'll see how close we can get to Washington, not past Washington. Um, again, a lot of this slide is based for AP U.S. history, so there's a lot of stuff you just don't have to know. So I'm going to go through the things that you do have to know. If you have any questions, though, by all means, let me know. Um, and so we're going to talk about English colonization, and we're going to begin with the southern colonies here. Um, the four, or rather, uh, one, two, three, four, five southern colonies you guys have to know are Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland. So those are the five southern colonies you guys have to know. Again, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland. Those are the five you have to know. Uh, the southern colonies are also known as the Chesapeake colonies. So if they ever ask you what was a major trend of the Chesapeake colonies, they just mean the southern colonies. Don't get too confused about that. And again, abbreviations are always key. Okay. Um, you don't really have to know why they come, but one of the major reasons why they do start coming to America are first kind of uh, the literary argument. Uh, many of them come to America because Sir Thomas More writes the book Utopia, and so uh, the perfect world is kind of inspired. And so they say, well, maybe the perfect world is in America. So they start looking for this utopia. So utopia is one of the first major reasons why we start coming to America. Another major reason we come to America is for a nationalist reason. Uh, we defeat the Spanish Armada in 1588, and we feel pretty good about that. We defeat the Spanish Armada. Uh, the Catholics of Spain come and try to conquer Protestant England, you know, restore Catholicism. And so they're defeated. Actually, we defeat the Spanish. The English defeat the Spanish. We feel pretty good about ourselves. And one of the major reasons why we won, do you guys know the story about how we defeated the Catholics? The divine, or rather, the Protestant wind defeated them. The Protestant wind. And what that was, was when the Spanish Armada, this massive fleet of Spanish ships, converged on England, a hurricane showed up and destroyed them. And so we believed that if uh, it's Catholics versus Protestants and a hurricane just defeated our enemies, God is on our side. So it's called the Protestant wind. And when you feel that God is on your side, you feel pretty confident about colonizing. And so the nationalistic reason for colonizing at this time is that Protestant wind. You know, you can go anywhere because God has your back. That's pretty good. Another reason why people start moving at this time um, is that land is running out in England uh, because of a law called the Enclosure Movement. The Enclosure Movement. You might recall this from uh, some world history in the past. Wool was becoming really, really expensive. And so rather than letting poor farmers just farm wherever they wanted, they began to close off all the private farms and make large farms. And they would kick all the tenants off. And so because there was no farmland left, they moved to the cities. Because there was no job in the cities, they said, well, we might as well go to America. Okay, so that's another reason, enclosure movement. And lastly, another major reason is primogenitor. There was a law called primogenitor. Primogenitor was an age-old law that said, and this is actually something that was pretty common uh, up until like the 1900s, uh, was that the estate would be inherited by the eldest son. The reason they did this was to prevent civil war. You know, sons would kill each other whenever their father died just to acquire the land. So in order to kind of eliminate all that war, they created primogenitor. Now, did that create inequality, gender inequality? Yes, it did. And did that make younger sons angry? Of course. But the whole point was to prevent war. And so primogenitor uh, made all the lands go to the eldest son, which meant if you're a younger son, you had nothing in your name. So if there's nothing for you here in England, you might as well go to America and make a name for yourself. So for all these reasons, uh, people start moving to the Americas. Uh, then there's a religious reason of like, this evangelization. You know, we, we form the Anglican Church. And um, if you recall, the Anglican Church was part of the Reformation. King Henry breaks away because he wants to be with his his new mistress, and that's not gonna work out for him, so he gets a divorce. So everyone's pretty happy that he gets a divorce, uh, rather, that he uh, breaks away from the Catholic Church. But he doesn't really change for religious reasons. 
he changes for political reasons. And the only big difference between the Anglican Church or the Church of England and the Catholic Church was that instead of a pope in charge, the king was in charge. That was it. There was no fundamental change. Like if you look at non-Catholic churches today, they might not do communion or they may not pray to the saints or they may not have these elaborate churches or females might be ministers. In the Anglican church, the only change was, uh, I am in charge now. The king is in charge so he can divorce, give himself a divorce. That was it. There's a lot of non-changes here. Um, don't worry about these guys. Uh, and so one of the major reasons why this becomes an issue is that a group of Puritans emerge, and I may end up talking about this later, I forget, but a group of Puritans emerge who believe that the Anglican church is still too Catholic. No, you didn't really change much, King Henry. We appreciate you breaking away, but it's not different enough. So we want to purify the Anglican church of its Catholicness. So they become the Puritans. The English get really annoyed with them. You know, they, they take away all the fun things. You know, you can't wear colorful clothing, not allowed to laugh, uh, just really boring, very strict rules. And so eventually, uh, the Puritans do come to power for a while, and then they're thrown out of power, and we begin to persecute them because we hate these guys. I mean, they were horrible, they were strict, they made our lives hell. So we harass the crap out of them, we tax them, we tax them, we pick on them, we, you know, we, we throw rocks at their churches, and eventually they feel so harassed that they leave, and they come to America looking for religious freedom. You guys know the story. Fun fact, when they were in charge, they did not give religious freedom to others. They want religious freedom for themselves, but they are not by any means religiously tolerant, which is what a lot of people forget or are never taught. You know, the Puritans came to America for religious freedom, yeah, for themselves. But when the Catholics came, they're like, no, get back, no, this is, this is religious freedom for us, not for you. Don't worry about these guys. Ah, so we finally get to Virginia. So in 1607, the Virginia Joint Stock Company comes to Virginia. In 1607, the Virginia Joint Stock Company arrives in Virginia. Now, a joint stock company um, is pretty much designed to limit risk. Instead of having one person invest in your voyage, you have like 300 so that if you lose, you only lose $5 versus $5,000 basic idea. So this joint stock company arrives, and uh, again, they land here in Virginia, and things are uh, not so good. Um, first of all, Virginia is a swamp. You, know, you can't really tell today, but back then, Virginia is mosquito infested. It's hot. It's swampy. There's diseases there. And there are angry Native Americans that don't like us too much. Well, uh, the other problem is that there are too many gentlemen and not enough workers. There are men there just looking for wealth and money that don't really know how to work. And so these men don't really know how to do things like build shelter. They don't really forage for food. They don't know how to do those things. And also, uh, they don't build homes for themselves because there aren't any women. So who are they going to impress? There's really nothing. There's no really no reason. I'm going to live outside under a tent. I'm cool with that. So they don't build shelter. They don't really forage for food. They don't save their food. They don't really know how to hunt very well. So you have too many gentlemen and not enough workers. Um, and really because the major reason why they're there are the three G's. You guys familiar with the three G's of why people explore? Gold. Why else do we want to explore the world? Or explore the world. We want to bring gold, glory, you know, reputation for yourself, and God. Or God, glory, gold, gold, glory, God, whichever order you want to put it in. But those are the three G's. That's for any exploration. It doesn't matter what, who you're talking to, Spanish, English, Americans, what have you. They always came for the three G's, God, glory, and gold. Well, as you can see, none, nowhere in those three G's does it contain the uh, really important factor of preparing for the winter. And so they didn't prepare for the winter. And in their first winter, they dealt with something called... Well, the first winter wasn't so bad, except for the fact that, if my numbers are correct, of the first 90, only 30 survived because they didn't do a very good job preparing for the winter. And things were really bad, and they all almost died, and they would have died if it wasn't for this man, Captain John Smith. 
Captain John Smith saves Jamestown the first time by instituting military policy. And he gives the very famous quote, he who shall not work shall not eat. So all you gentlemen out there who are not working, who don't know how to work, well, if you want to eat today, you better get off your butt and get to work because this is a team effort. So he who shall not work shall not eat. He saves Jamestown. He does a few other things. Uh, he raids local Native American villages at night and steals supplies. And during the day, he trades with them. He's like, oh, I uh, hear you're missing some corn. You know, we just happen to have some. Uh, in exchange, we need some leather. So that would happen. But he would attack some, trade with others, kind of dependent on, you know, which tribe. Um, but the local region was uh, surrounded by a group called the Pohatons. It was a local Native American group. In any case, you may also be familiar with the story of John Smith and Pocahontas. Um, as Disney might recall, uh, John Smith eventually uh, dates Pocahontas and they get married, which is absolutely not true. Uh, Pocahontas does, in fact, save John Smith's life, uh, quote unquote. Uh, but there are stories now that perhaps she wasn't really saving his life it was just a ritual um uh and Pocahontas by that by that was only 13 at the time and John Smith was like 28 so if they were dating that's that's grounds for uh felony charges so I can't really do that I guess back then it was cool but it's just a weird story but anyway things are great uh, he saves Jamestown everything is good um and then one day, uh, again, not going to be on the test, but uh, he's sleeping by the campfire, and he's on patrol, but he's sleeping by the campfire, and he has his, uh, his pouch of gunpowder on him, just because, you know, just in case he get attacked. And w one of the uh, embers from the fire actually ignites his gunpowder, and he catches on fire. And he actually suffers from pretty severe burns, so he's forced to go back to England. And there's no one there to take care of the colonists anymore because, again, they only survived because of John Smith. And so because of that, um, well, we're not there yet, uh, but because of that, uh, John Smith leaves and the colonists now have to deal with another winter by themselves. Now, another ship has arrived already, so the colonists now number about 400. And then they reach the next winter, and the next winter is called the Starving Time, which I imagine you can tell was a great time for all of them. Uh, but the starving time of the people during the starving time only 60 survive wow. yeah so they all died again because no one was there to you know, keep tabs on them no one was there to control them and they were just unruly and didn't want to do any work and no military policies uh, they got so desperate they ate bark they would eat weeds um, in fact they would boil their hats shoes and belts because it contained the protein from the skins and so they got desperate and ate their own clothing um, very few cases of cannibalism like very 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 few so uh, I don't care who you talk to it's very few uh, tell them no it's very rare if even so things are bad and uh, it looks like things are not going well uh, and so eventually uh, they get saved I'm trying to figure out what order this is ah by my name Lord Delawar Lord Delawar arrives on a ship after that winter and he says you guys are idiots what have you guys been doing because so many of your people are dead and so he institutes military policy and Lord Delaware saves Jamestown for the first time and one of the major things that Lord Delaware does is he builds fort walls genius like oh walls that's what would keep the Native Americans out that's it's pretty smart Especially considering how giant the Native Americans were. I mean, it's terrifying. <laughs> 30 feet tall Native Americans. Um, here, Poetan Wars. I don't know that so much. Uh, here is Jamestown back then. Good times. Um, Jamestown eventually expands, as you guys can see. It begins here, and then gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, yeah, and then Jamestown was saved as a result of Lord Delaware. Everyone good so far in the foundings of Jamestown? Okay. Jamestown will eventually become the colony of Virginia, but Jamestown was the first city and it grows to Virginia. So Jamestown becomes pretty prosperous. It becomes pretty wealthy and it's because of this man. This man is John Rolfe. Uh, 
And John Rolfe is the man that makes Jamestown, or pretty much Virginia, very, very successful. Because John Rolfe introduces what crop to the southern colonies? Corn. Not yet. Now, corn was actually pretty indigenous here already. Corn was growing way back when. Not wheat. Tobacco. Oh. Tobacco. So John Rolfe introduces tobacco to the southern colonies. Now, tobacco is actually indigenous to the Americas. But during the Columbian Exchange back in 1492, uh, we brought this uh, tobacco to England uh, back in the 1400s. And they angli anglic uh, anglicized it. Is that a word? Uh, they made it more English. They made it sweeter, I guess, is, is one way to put it. And then he brought it back to America where it was much easier grown because the English climate is not great for tobacco at all, which is why you don't see people growing tobacco in, like, Maine or in Massachusetts. Uh, yeah. What's the time period? Um, so in 1607, the Virginia Joint Stock Company, right? Mm -hmm. And then when does John Smith come? When does so John Smith comes within that first group, and then Lord Delaware arrives by 1610. Oh, John Rolfe comes with Lord Delaware. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so he introduces tobacco, and tobacco is great. Um, tobacco does a lot of huge things for the colonies. Actually, it changes, revolutionizes the colonies. The first thing is tobacco is terrible for the soil. It eats it up. Uh, it drains all the nutrients. So if you grow tobacco in this plot one year, you can't grow in the same plot. So naturally, what are you going to have to do? You have to expand your farm. And then when you grow here, you can't grow there anymore. This one's still recovering, so you have to expand even more. So because of the tobacco crop um, that kind of drained and destroyed the soil, they begin something called crop rotation, where you, you instead of having just one farm, you have three farms. They're massive. And so the crop rotation system forces these colonists to have these massive farms. And those massive farms become known as plantations. Plantations uh, are run by the planters, people just these large farm owners, the planter class, and they begin these plantations. Now, once you have these large plantations, you need workers, very good. And so, who are we going to get to work on these plantations? Not yet. Correct. So, in 1618, a man named Edwin Sandy, you don't have to know his name, it creates a, a system called the Headright System in 18, six, or 1618, rather. The Headright System. And the Headright System was a pretty basic system. It's also known as the Indentured Servant System. And when you're indentured, it just means you're on contract. So, an indentured servant system. And what the indentured servant system said was that. I will pay for you to come to America, okay? I will give you passage, food, and shelter. The basics. Passage, food, shelter. Passage being the most expensive. So passage, food, and shelter. In exchange, you will work for me for seven years. That's on average. Now this may seem like a lot, but back then this is a pretty sweet deal. You get to come to America almost for free. And you're going to work your way. And it's not like you're going to starve while you're here. He's still going to feed you. He's still going to uh, give you shelter. He's going to pay for you to come to America. And likely he'll give you a small plot of land when you get here. So for seven years of work is actually pretty worth it. And so you have the beginnings of the headright system. Or the indentured servant system. And many, many indentured servants start coming to America. Uh, and this is one of the major reasons why you have this large population growth, the indentured servant system. One thing to note, though, uh, is that, what was I going to say? I lost my train of thought. Uh, so, head right system, indentured servant system, it's going to populate and start having them work the farms. A free thorn letter. Uh, I didn't bring it with me. Um, what you should note, though, uh, if you ever get a chance to read the free thorn letter, uh, is that life on the plantation sucked. It was not fun, it was not easy. Uh, a lot of people went back home because they felt like they were being mistreated by their owners. Sometimes they would work for seven years and then the guy would be like, oh, you know, I don't have any money for you, sorry, get off my land. So that happened from time to time. Can they break their contract? Uh, sure you could, but if you break your contract as an indentured servant, uh, remember, you still, you're indebted to me. And so you owe me. So if you break your contract, you go to jail. 
if I break my contract, well, technically, I don't owe you anything. I've already paid everything to you. So you're just paying me back. So I have every right to not pay you. You don't have a right to just break the contract on your end, but I do. Anyway, uh, despite all this, Virginia grows, as you can see, and we went from that original small Jamestown colony to a much more expansive uh, Virginia as it grows from that point on. Uh, in 1619, because the population is growing pretty rapidly, uh, you see the first democratic institution in America, or in North America, uh, the House of Burgesses, or the House of Burgesses, depending on who you talk to. The House of Burgesses, or the House of Burgesses. A burgessy, by the way, is just a representative. I forget what language it is. German or some Dutch thing. But House of Burgesses, or the House of Burgesses in 1619. This is the introduction of democracy to America. Because the colony has gotten so large, we need democracy. Because uh, the people are going to get un unruly and unrestful. So uh, we have to give them some form of representation. So House of Burgesses is pretty cool. Um, yeah. One of the powers that the House of Burgesses has is the power of the purse. It's called power of the purse. Uh, which gives them the power over money. And in particular, uh, they pay the governor's salary. So to make sure the governor is doing what the colonists want, they control the governor's salary, hence power of the purse. Congress has this today, or at least the House of Representatives has the power of the purse today, which we believe to be one of the most important powers uh, in a government, the power to control money. Interestingly enough, in the same year that we introduced democracy to America, we introduced slavery to America. So 1619 is a paradoxical year for many historians. We see that in 1619, the same year we introduce democracy, we introduce slavery. Slavery was introduced for a number of reasons, but primarily there was a huge economic value that slaves had. The argument was that slaves are great because the minimum amount of slaves you really needed was two to be really, really successful. And why was that? True. That's not wrong. But why two? Ultimately, the biggest reason why slaves were awesome is that slaves are expensive. Don't get me wrong. Slaves are like worth uh, like a $200,000 Mercedes Benz today. Very expensive. But if you could afford two of them, one, they worked for a lifetime. And two, when they had kids, you own the kids. I mean, the Barbados slave codes are something that um, kind of inspired American slave codes, the Barbados slave codes. But there are a few rules there. Number one, you own the children. No other slave system at this time had that. Africans, yes, they had slavery before we did. They were enslaving each other. But they believed in war slavery. I own you because I defeated you in war. That doesn't mean I own your children. The Europeans, especially the, and the British Americans, very unique in that they said, I own you and I own your children. I own you as property. So that was a unique change. Also, they didn't demand rights. They weren't demanding the right to vote. They weren't demanding representation in government. And so unlike the indentured servants who are English citizens, who do believe they have the right to vote, who do believe it, who are expecting good treatment, slaves were accustomed to being slaves because we bought them from slave owners in Africa. The Portuguese sold them to us. So it wasn't weird for them to like, no, not have rights. They were used to that already. So there's a lot of good reason why we, the slaves were pretty useful for us. Um, but again, it's a strange year in 1619 when we introduced 20 slaves and democracy at the same time. So again, here are some of the basic slave codes that begin. You can't have a runaway slave. You can return them, all that stuff. Oh, also fun fact. Uh, when the first slaves were brought, the first 20 slaves, we assumed they would just be indentured servants. But after seven years, when they didn't ask for their freedom, we thought, well, how long... <laughs> can we keep this going? And it turned out they weren't going to ask for their freedom because they didn't know they could. And so we just said, okay, well, cool. 
Uh, not initially. I mean, like, there's some basic communication you can always get done, but I mean, pantomiming and whatever else. Some of them were taught how to speak Spanish or Portuguese or English or eventually. So, I mean, it, it only takes, I mean, a few months for them to learn the basics of what you need them to know. So, and their children will learn. One of the other reasons why uh, we like slaves is that they don't rebel. Indentured servants rebel. Case in point, this is the famous Virginia Rebellion, known as Bacon's Rebellion, which is delicious. All you have to know about Bacon's Rebellion was Nathaniel Bacon led a rebellion of indentured servants, demanding rights, or political rights, and protection from Native Americans. So it was a, a rebellion led by Nathaniel Bacon, that guy there, um, who wanted political rights and protection from Native Americans. Pretty much what happened was that there were two groups that kind of emerged in Virginia. If Virginia was a rectangle, the ones living along the coast were called the Tidewater, and the ones living uh, near the forest that Native Americans were called the Backcountry. So the Tidewater or the Tidewater elite were the wealthy ones, and the Backcountry settlers were the poor. And so the problem was that if you lived in the Backcountry, you were constantly being attacked by Native Americans. And the backcountry were used as a buffer for the rich who were not being attacked because you had to get through backcountry first. The other problem was that the capital of Virginia was there in the Tidewater area. And so they felt that in order to vote, you had to go all the way to the Tidewater just to get represented. So they demanded um, more protection from Native Americans and political rights. Was Nathaniel Bacon an No, uh, he was actually a Tidewater um, who kind of fell out of repute and he moved to the back country also because the governor at the time governor berkeley um he was engaged in illegal fur trades with the um, native americans and bacon wanted to have those fur trades instead so it was personal greed whatever else uh, bacon's rebellion fails i mean it does not pan out uh bacon dies and uh of disease and the rest of them are hung uh, but he does give them what they want the, the governor, after it kills, killing them all, says, you know what, they did have a point. So we should give it to them because we don't want them to rebel again. But the key <laughs> point here is that, number one, this is why we don't want indentured servants anymore. Indentured servants rebel. Slaves will rebel in the future, but they're not yet. They're docile. And if they rebel, they're just angry. These guys are rebelling for things like political rights. It's crazy. So that's Bacon's Rebellion. Anyway, here's where Bacon's Rebellion began. Bacon's here, right there, attack, good times. Maryland. Not too much you guys have to know about Maryland. <clears throat> the first thing you should know is that Maryland was founded by this man, Lord Baltimore. Baltimore, by the way, being a title, not to be confused with Voldemort, which many kids hear when I say Lord Baltimore, they think Lord Voldemort. Anyway, Lord Baltimore was part of the Calvert family. Calvert, so they were the Calverts, and Lord Baltimore was again a title that you gave them when you were in charge of uh, Maryland. And Maryland was unique because this was created as a Catholic refuge. Just like the Puritans who were not welcome in England, neither were the Catholics. So the Catholics fled to Maryland, and Lord Baltimore, who was a friend of the king at the time, said, uh, can I create a, um, a kingdom there, or at least a territory there for the Catholics? Like, yeah, whatever, go ahead. And so Lord Baltimore uh, creates this Catholic refuge for the Catholics. And in 1649, he creates a law called the Act of Toleration. And the Act of Toleration guaranteed religious freedom to all Christians. It was religious freedom to all Christians except Jews or Muslims, because screw those guys, according to the Baltimores at the time. But religious freedom for all Christians 
except for Jews and Muslims. Now, this wasn't because they believed that you know Protestants were cool and all. This was because they knew, and they were pretty smart about it. They had the foresight. The Protestants were immigrating to America still, just at the same time as the Catholics, and they knew that eventually the Catholics would become a minority. So, by giving the Protestants religious freedom now, they were protecting themselves in the future. We're saying, oh, no, remember how we protected your rights? You're going to protect ours too, right? Uh, so that was the basic idea. Was uh, They had the foresight in knowing that they were going to become a minority in the future, so they should protect their own rights. Eventually, the Protestants do take over, and then the Protestants overturn the Act of Toleration, telling the Catholics, sorry, but uh, no, we're not going to recognize your rights. So they take away all their rights, and uh, they're not allowed to serve in office, they're not allowed to worship in public. Um, yeah. Not cool. Uh, their, uh, what do you call it, Rep representative body at the time, their democratic institution, was the House of Delegates, established in 1635. Carolinas, you don't really have to know, but the Carolinas uh, were once one big Carolina, which is the Carolinas. Uh, and then we divide them in two. Right down the middle. Like that. In any case, uh, the reason why the Carolinas are divided um, are that they were just two very different colonies. South Carolina was by far the wealthiest colony of all of them, of all 13. South Carolina was the wealthiest of all 13 colonies because of what they grew. And they grew these three things. Do you guys know what those three things are? Not tobacco, because Virginia was growing that already. What was unique? Huh? Uh, close, it's rice. They grew rice. Rice. The plant in the middle is indigo. And on the far right, that's sugar. Rice, indigo, and sugar. Interestingly, these are the key cash crops of the South Carolinas. I mean, Virginia, Maryland, they both grew tobacco, but South Carolina made all of its money off of rice, indigo, and sugar. A little bit of tobacco here and there, but this made much more money than tobacco anyway. Is that just part of the picture? Much, much, much okay. later. I would say 1800s, 1820s. We're still 1600s. That's okay. yeah, so about 200 years. Now, indigo, by the way, the reason why this is so important is that when you take the plant indigo, it makes the color purple. The color purple at the time uh, was the color of royalty. And so the only way to get the color purple at the time, which is why it was the color of royalty, was you had to go deep sea diving into the ocean for sea snails. And you would take them and you would crush them and the pigment that came out of the sea snails was purple, which is why it was so expensive to buy purple clothing. Well, the indigo plant found in the Americas allowed you to look royal without spending that much money. And so indigo became a very, very, coveted plant that you can then make the color purple out of. That's why they made so much money in South Carolina. North Carolina, however, did not do so well. North Carolina had poor soil, mostly indentured servants. So North Carolina decides, you know what? We are not happy with our relationship with South Carolina, so they just split. They go their own separate ways. And then there's Georgia. Georgia is founded as a debtor's colony. So people that had debts in England, they said, look, you guys owe a lot of people money. So how about this? We're going to give you a second chance. Hence, it's called the second chance colony. And we're going to let you live in Georgia and forgive all your debts. But you have to live in Georgia. Now, you might think, well, that's a pretty sweet deal. You get to come to America, debt's all forgiven. I mean, what's the deal there? The deal was this. This here is Georgia, this territory right here. South Carolina is the wealthiest colony at the time. Below them is Spanish Florida. And Spanish Florida is constantly attacking South Carolina because they want their trade. <laughs> Georgia, if you're going to live there, is created as a buffer colony. The goal is, look, we're going to forgive your debts, but the expectation is that you're going to live in Georgia, 
and he will serve as a buffer for any Spanish invasions. So you know what? That's better than being in prison? Sure. And so the English felt like they had something to do, and their job was to repel Spanish invasions if they ever happened. Uh, they had some very strict laws in Georgia, by the way. You weren't allowed to have alcohol. You weren't allowed to have slaves. You weren't allowed to have large plantations either, and this picture kind of illustrates that. If above here is South Carolina and below here is Florida and this entire colony, let's say it's Georgia, if the Spanish were coming and you guys had only small farms, then the Spanish would have to pass through every single one and that's a pretty good buffer. Whereas if you only had Georgia and you had like four big farms and you were different parts of it, they could pass right through and no one would know. So they said no plantations, small farms only because then you're more dense, more populated. So kind of smart stuff. Also they said though, you can't be Catholic. You're not allowed to be Catholic in Georgia because why can't you be Catholic in Georgia? Because the Spanish were Catholic. And the basic idea is, is there an argument that maybe some people will put religion over government? Sure. And so because of the fear that people would put religion over government, they said, you can't be Catholic here. So they said, no alcohol, no slaves, no plantations. You can't have nice things either. No like luxurious items of any kind. And no Catholicism. Eventually, people stopped coming to Georgia because they're like, you know what? Screw that. That's, that doesn't seem fun at all. Uh, and so they said, okay, fine. You can have plantations and slaves and luxurious things. Um, and you can have alcohol. But you can't be Catholic still. So they repeal everything but you still can't be Catholic for fear of Spanish in the South. So a general overview of the colonies, the Southern colonies anyway. Again, also known as the Chesapeake. In terms of their economies, what did they mostly grow? Let's look at the graphs. They mostly grew what? Tobacco. It's mostly tobacco. It's majority. I mean, Virginia, Maryland, uh, even parts of Georgia, North Carolina, they all grew tobacco. I mean, tobacco is the main one. But the key cash, these are all called cash crops, uh, but the key cash crops for South Carolina were, again, rice, indigo, and sugar. So good times. And yes, they had to grow wheat because otherwise, how would they eat? So, I mean, wheat was still being grown, but wheat wasn't a cash crop. And what I mean by that was wheat was being grown by farmers to subsist. Hence, you have the term subsistence farmers. If you weren't a wealthy plantation owner, or if you weren't doing well financially, then you were like, but you did own a piece of land, then you were a subsistence farmer. And a subsistence farmer was a farmer that grew just enough to survive, but you did not grow any crops for profit. So if you were selling tobacco, rice, wheat, indigo, sugar, not wheat. Uh, if you grew those four things, then you were likely a planter or you were likely a commercial pro a farmer. But if you were growing just wheat, you were a subsistence farmer because you weren't growing anything to sell. You were growing just to survive to the next day. And yeah, and again, wheat, rice. We didn't really consume rice in the colonies. It was too expensive. We would sell rice to back to England. If you could afford rice here, great. But most families could not because rice was pricey. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever had to farm rice. It's not fun. It's very difficult. Not easy at all. They did include slaves, so you do see slaves and plantations emerging throughout the South. You also see indentured servants that will eventually be, be replaced by slaves. So why do we replace indentured servants with slaves? Yeah, they rebel. They're, they're more likely to demand rights. Slaves are docile so far. Um, in the South, there's higher death rates than the North. Uh, I believe the life expectancy in the South was 50 compared to the North at 70. Um, it was just hotter, more disease, Native American attacks were pretty common, that kind of thing. So mortality is more common in the South. But women did have more power in the South. Women were more prominent in the South because men kept on dying. So women were more in charge of the home. Um, religion wasn't too important in the South, with the exception of... Uh, Catholics, but religion wasn't that important. Just because if you have plantations, you don't have towns. And if you don't have towns, you don't have people congregating at a church. 
So you don't really have religion being important in the South, nor is education highly emphasized in the South. So, Because what they're doing is they're not bankers. They're just farmers, and so you don't really need an education for that. Let me talk about House of Burgesses. Do they have politics, all that stuff? Cool, cool. So that's uh, the southern colonies. You guys want to move straight into the New England colonies? Let's finish the colonies first, and we'll take a break. The northern colonies, New England. So the northern colonies or the New England colonies. What do you notice already is very different from the New England colonies versus the southern colonies? There, well, yeah, there's a lot of families there, not just men. Um, also large people. And what are they doing here that's different from the uh, south? Religion. Yeah, religion is very important in the, in the north. Religion is hugely important in the north. As you can see, I mean, the first image is a guy praying, so that's pretty critical. The Reformation, you guys should already know. Uh, I'm not too worried about that. But we talked about the Puritans already and King Henry VIII divorcing his wife and all the women that he lusted for. So there's that. As we talked about the Puritans, the Puritans wanted to purify the Catholic Church, so they fled because they were mistreated and they came to the Americas. Uh, and they land at Plymouth Rock. So the Puritans finally land at Plymouth Rock. Fun fact, Plymouth Rock is not a thing not real. They didn't land on a rock. I should also point out that where they originally landed was here. And they're like, no, no, that's not good. Let's go here. That's what they did later. Despite the fact that Plymouth Rock is not real, in the 1800s, late 1800s, a man in a bar in Massachusetts one day said, oh, I remember the time my great-grandfather told me a story about when the, uh, the, 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 the Plymouth colonists first came. And they landed a... Uh, Right there, right on that rock. That's uh, Plymouth Rock, which is not true at all. But it was a, it was a, it was a bar tale. And so today, if you go to Massachusetts, yeah, there is a, uh, yeah, it's like this little uh, monument to Plymouth Rock. Which one? It's not like this massive rock that a boat could land on. It's a tiny rock. Likely also, it's just a random rock that stamped 1630 or 1620 on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Also, it's not anything. <laughs> so that's the other part. It's a monument built around nothing. Uh, it's a rock, sure. It's not any rock of significance <laughs> at all. But it's, uh, it's an interesting story that people believe to be. Well, yeah, I went there also. I'm like, this is, this is so not true. None of this is true. And people were asking why. I'm like, they did not land here. And I had a map with me. Like, you see, <laughs> they landed here on the other side near Cape Cod and realized that was not sufficient. So they moved across the way. Uh, but yeah, Plymouth Colony is not. Well, Plymouth Colony is real, it's just not on Plymouth Rock. In any case, uh, the, one of the first things they did before even getting off the boat was they signed the Mayflower Compact. The Mayflower Compact is a foundation for self-government. Oh, the Red Cross. Uh, Mayflower is the, again, the found, Mayflower Compact is the foundation for self-government is what we like to call it, because they agreed to consent of the governed, they agreed to loyalty to the king, uh, they agreed to, again, democracy of some degree. Because they were afraid that once they got off the boat that people would, like, go crazy. <laughs> because many of these people wanted to break away from England. They were, they were separatists. They're like, no, the Puritans are what's right. The king and the queen don't know what they're talking about. So they wanted to break away. And so they forced them to sign this document. And some people always ask, your students will ask, well, why don't they just sign it and then leave? You can't do that back then. Signing your name is a big deal. You don't just sign your name for frivolous things, unlike today where you sign your name on anything, you don't even pay attention to what you're signing. Back then, you sign your name and it means something. So if they didn't sign it, oh, well, basically everybody had to Everyone had to sign. Say, we're not going to get off this boat until everyone signs this document. Well, the men. Women don't get to sign. Because <laughs> they're women. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> not going to happen. I mean, as you can see, the men are signing the document, and women are in the back just like reading or like taking care of the children, you know, doing womanly duties. And so they arrive, and things are great, and they have the first Thanksgiving, and things are good. And look, and the Native Americans are hanging out, they're having a great time. 
Charlie Brown was there. He invented basketball, if you remember from the story about how he was picking fruit uh, from a tree and there was a basket. And then he threw a ball up and it got stuck in the basket. He's like, well, that's horrible. This is a stupid game. I know. Let's cut a hole in the basket. And then you throw the ball, it'll come back to you. And thus, Charlie Brown invented basketball during the first Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, I always like having this little section. This is not important to your test, but it's always fun for the kids, the Pilgrim's myths and reality. And I think I have it. Oh. No, I don't. I'll give you guys a copy next time. Uh, so here's like this really nice image of the Pilgrims, you know, like uh, sharing food with the colonists and things are great. Fun fact, no turkey. There was not turkey in, in that region at that time. They probably ate like fowl and duck and whatever else, but no turkey. Uh, so why do we celebrate them? Well, we idealize them because, you know, religious freedom, created the democratic form of government, dealt with Native Americans correctly from the very beginning. We invited the Wampanoag to the first Thanksgiving. We're like, man, the, the Puritans were awesome. These pilgrims were great. Uh, we were heroes, politically, religiously, socially. But uh, really, were we? Well, no, we, we disrespected them. We were unfair to them. It wasn't like this holy festival either. It was just like another random dinner and then the Native Americans just showed up. It wasn't like, guys, we've made this feast for everyone. No, they were eating and Native Americans showed up like, oh, uh, I think we have some left. Here, have some food. They did not have turkey, which blows some kids' minds. They're like, what? Yeah, no turkey, guys. Uh, the pilgrims also never planned to follow the Mayflower Compact. Many of them were, I mean, hoping to sign and then leave and then it didn't pan out. Um, and again, it wasn't really democratic because not everyone signed. For example, women did not sign. If you were an indentured servant, you did not sign. Indentured servants couldn't sign the Mayflower Compact because you weren't a free man. You were indentured. And until you're a free man, this doesn't apply to you. So it's kind of crazy. Um, or, you know, it's pretty awesome. It was a holiday. Indians were treated and they were honored. Uh, you know, we did give free men a say in the government. It served as a foundation for self-government. So which is the correct point of view? You decide. And so we give them documents. And you actually will see the documents in a second. Um, again, they'll analyze primary sources. You know, what kind of, you know, is this a stereotype? You know, where was this a primary source or is this a secondary source? Is this from like the 1930s or from like the 1600s? And it is important to say, well, it looks good, but if this is a painting from the 1930s, by that time, were they already influenced by that bias of the great pilgrims of the time? And then we discuss. Uh, but again, here's the Mayflower Compact. It looks pretty awesome. Like, everyone was involved. Women were there. Um, here you have the actual Mayflower Compact on the right saying, you know, covenant to God, and we have a body politic. So it shows kind of the greatness of this, uh, this you know, religious institution, this Mayflower Compact, and everyone's involved, you know, in the cover of Night by Candlelight, how they're, you know, drastically riding away. And even some women were there. So here is that photo again. I mean, are women involved there? Getting, you know, participating? That's cool. However, you might see some other people saying that it wasn't so much greatness. It was actually pretty terrible. You know, the first Thanksgiving, and you know, oh, it was great. You know, we invited everyone over. Uh, but the other one was like, no, not really. I mean, they kind of just showed up. And they just appeared, and things weren't that great. Well, there's that. I'll give you guys these documents later. So again, uh, you would ask them then which of these is the correct one. And again, a good single paragraph or two gets them. And this is, again, the first unit. So to get them to start writing already on stuff that they already have prior knowledge to, is pretty pretty helpful. They'll actually be able to do stuff with this. So I think that's kind of kind of neat. So uh, the next colony you guys should know then, Plymouth Colony is eventually absorbed by Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, but not yet. 1691, they get absorbed. Not important, though. Um, and so you have Massachusetts Bay Colony established in Boston in 1630. And Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, appointed John Winthrop as the governor. John Winthrop as the governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony. And one of his major goals for Mass Bay was to make Mass Bay, or MBC, a beacon on a hill, or a city on a hill. You guys might hear presidents talk about America as a beacon or a city on a hill all the time during the States of the Union. The basic idea was that he wanted the society to be strictly religious, and he wanted everyone to have a covenant with God. A covenant with God, a relationship, an agreement with God. So it was a very religious, religious community. 
And the expectation was if everyone lives their life religiously and devoted to God, we'll be successful. And if we're successful, we'll become this beacon on a hill and we will be a shining example to the old world about what we can do as Puritans. So the beacon on the hill philosophy was be, uh, he wanted to be a shining example to the world. You know, be just like us. And again, every president, uh, for the most part, has made this common uh, thread of we want America to be, or America is, a beacon on the hill for democracy, human rights, economy, freedoms. So that's the key argument. The American exceptionalism that you always hear, you know, we are the best. Uh, their, uh, one of their, their representative body up there in the top left is the general court. This is their uh, House of Representatives, but it's called the general court. Good times. One of the entrances, by the way, not even important at all, um, is dedicated to Thomas Hooker, the general, and it's called the Hooker Entrance. The hooker gate, and so we all just laugh when we walk by. <laughs> uh, American politics today. This is where the hookers come in, <laughs> which is appropriate. Um, the New England colonies, especially Massachusetts, was full of small towns because they were all small farmers. They're all small towns, small farmers, and the most democratic. F uh, every town had town meetings. They all had town meetings which was the most democratic form of governments in the colonies. Because everyone had a voice in the town meetings. Not everyone could vote, but everyone had a voice in the town meetings. So when you talk about the most democratic form of government, it's town meetings in the New England colonies because everyone had a voice. Even women could be like, you know what? We need more wheat because we're running out of cereal for the kids. So we need that. Or we need uh, more men to start producing more cotton because we need more clothes or whatever. But what it came down to was, again, it was most democratic because everyone had a voice. Uh, they were also deeply religious communities, deeply religious communities, and they're very close-knit communities, so very close together. So again, unlike the South, where you would not see this many families living right next to each other, here it's a very tight-knit community. The Puritan lifestyle was fun. Uh, most of the time was spent with family time and church. Uh, people always wonder, you know, if you've ever been to Boston or the old, the Trinity churches, why there are boxes around uh, the pews. And it's because of the cold. What you would do is that you would put hot rocks or heat warmers on the bottom, and the radiant heat would fill that box, and it wouldn't just dissipate. And so your family would remain cold or warm while the minister was giving his sermon. And so you put foot warmers in there so that your family would stay warm during the sermon. Also, uh, you paid to be further up. And so like, if you gave more of a donation to the church, you could sit further and further up to be closer to God. So there was that. Again, uh, religious fervor was pretty big at the time. And my favorite part about it is maybe patriarchal society, but the best part is the kids. Oh, the kids. Uh, so the kids were publicly humiliated and beaten and shamed to keep them in line because pride was a big issue. You know, you wanted to be humble. So, you know, you run home, mommy, mommy, got an A on my test. Excuse me? Do you just run through the town <laughs> explaining that you got an A on your test? How dare you? So you would publicly beat or shame your child, take him to the middle of the town square. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen, my child does not understand the sins of pride. You take that back. Well, eventually, though, naturally, you would, you know, love your kids, and you would it'd be very difficult for you to beat your kids when they got older. So likely when they became 12 or 13, you would send your kids away to, uh, like, parents down you know, across town just so they could watch them for a while, and they would have no inhibitions about beating your kid because they don't love them. They're just random strangers. And so you would send your kids across town to get beaten even more just because they're not their kid. And so this is one way to kind of instill that sense of propriety, that sense of Christian value. So that's kind of fun. I like that story. I we just beat the kids left and right. Uh, capital, capital punishment was pretty popular in the North Falls. We used it. It wasn't used often, but they did use capital punishment uh, for things like stealing. Um, yeah. Scarlet Letter, you guys are familiar with adultery. So very, very just strict religious uh, society. 
There were religious dissenters, though, people that said, man, Massachusetts Bay, it's way too strict. We don't like their philosophies. There's two religious dissenters. First is this guy. This guy? That's Roger Williams. Roger Williams did not really like Massachusetts Bay too much because they weren't religiously tolerant. So Roger Williams leaves, and he creates Rhode Island and creates it for religious toleration. So I always like to tell my kids, Roger Williams created Rhode Island for religious toleration. R-W-R-I-R-T. But Roger Williams created Rhode Island for religious toleration. Also, he paid Native Americans for their land, unlike uh, the Massachusetts people. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was so excited to hear that. I was like, hey. Well, yeah, well, San Bernardino County is just huge. Yeah, it's a massive county. Like, yeah. Big. It's pretty crazy. Um, and then there's a, this other woman, Anne Hutchinson. Anne Hutchinson. Anne Hutchinson believed in something called antinomianism. And ultimately what antinomianism meant was that you did not have to follow man's law or the Bible. Oh, I probably, probably should have mentioned something that's really important that I didn't get around to. Um, all the Puritans at this time believed in something called predestination. The basic idea was that it didn't really matter what you did, God already knew you were going to heaven or hell. So if you lived a good life, that was some clues that you were going to heaven. If you're living a poor life, then God is probably punishing you. And you're destined to go to hell already. So predestination was, it was predestined whether or not you were going to heaven or hell. And Hutchinson pretty much promoted antinomianism. That said, you don't have to follow man's law or man's, or God, the Bible, because it doesn't really matter what you do. You're going to go to heaven or hell no matter what. You might kill a guy and you still might go to heaven because God's already predetermined that. So her philosophy was more like extreme predestination. You don't even have to go to church anymore because why? If you were gonna go to church, then that meant you were supposed to go to church. If you don't go to church, then God didn't want you to go to church. And it doesn't really matter. Do whatever you're gonna do because you were supposed to do that. If you don't wanna go to church, well then no big deal because God intended for you to do that anyway. It doesn't really matter. If they say, oh, you're gonna go to hell if you don't go to church. Why? God has already determined. It doesn't really matter what this guy says. So she was pretty dangerous. They didn't really like her so much. So they tried to banish her. But then she'd said something that was going to get her killed. They were going to kill her because they got really mad. She said, the reason why I know this is because I could talk to God directly. And that was a big no-no. You can't do that. Because the fear was, what if people believe her? And so they said, okay, Anne Hutchinson, you have a choice get out or we'll kill you. So she left. She lived in Rhode Island for a while with uh, Roger Williams and his colony and then she moved further west and she was killed by Native Americans. Which God intended, clearly. It's an extreme predestination. God wanted her to die by Native Americans. But yes, again, antinomianism, don't do good works or anything, just do whatever you want because God wants that. I mean, obviously she was still charitable, blah, 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 but you don't have to do exactly what man says because man doesn't know what they're talking about. The Bible also fallible, all that stuff. Um, there were Native American wars. So the two wars you guys should know in New England, I'm not going to go into detail about them, are King Philip's War, led by this guy, Medicom. They called him King Philip because, you know, he was a guy that he hated and King Philip was the king of Spain. But Medicom was his name. And the other war featured down here is the Pequot War. These are just two wars against Native Americans. Very bloody. But yeah, King Philip's War and Pequot War. Two Native American wars. 
And, uh, yeah, that's uh, about them. Uh, they were engaged in trade, the triangle trade you guys might be familiar with. Triangle trade was pretty much, uh, we would, oh, they would send Africans to America. We would send, uh, like, wheat to England. England would turn that wheat to liquor, and they would sell that liquor to the Africans to buy slaves to send to America. So triangle trade's pretty common. Um, so general overview of the northern colonies. I don't really have to worry about the other ones because they're not that important. Uh, small farms. So no plantations or few plantations, mostly small farmers. <clears throat> and a good majority of them uh, were also merchants, shipbuilders, engaged in fishing, all that stuff. Uh, family and religion was very important. Very important. Uh, but they had a lot of democracy, especially town meetings. They practiced the most democratic form of government in town meetings. And they had a Mayflower Compact, which is pretty cool. Let me do the... Uh, Middle colonies, real quick, then we'll take a break. The middle colonies. The two you guys have to know are New York and Pennsylvania. So, again, even though there are 13 colonies, there are colonies that, you know, you don't have to worry about. Like, for example, Delaware. <laughs> what, do we, what do we ever talk about Delaware? I mean, really. Who's there? Anyone here been to Delaware? Yeah, I've been in Delaware. What's, what's in Delaware? In every state. Nice. Well done. <laughs> One day, I'll, I'll try to do that. One day. Even Alaska and Hawaii? Yep. Well done. What about I the... finished Hawaii uh, 2008. Or uh, Alaska. What about the territories? No. Not yet. That's the next trip. Then. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be a bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so the two key territories you guys have to know with regard to the middle colonies are New York and Pennsylvania. We'll start off the conversation with New York. Uh, New York was originally founded by the Swedish, then taken over by the Dutch. So New York is sometimes known as New Sweden, also sometimes known as New Amsterdam. And uh, the British saw this, and they didn't like the fact that the Swedish and the Dutch were kind of just in the middle of their uh, expanding colonies. So they sent the Duke of York to conquer the, uh, the Dutch territories here. And actually, the people, the colonists there, were actually pretty happy with uh, the Duke of York taking over because they weren't too happy with Swedish control. Uh, so they actually willingly just give up and say, yeah, take us over, please. We would love to be under British rule. And so they willingly give up, and the Duke of York takes over New York. There he is, actually, Duke of York. Um, so that's that. Uh, interestingly enough, the Dutch do contribute a lot to American culture today. Just fun facts. Things like waffles, those are not American, those are Dutch. Santa Claus is not uh, is Dutch. Sinterklaas. Uh, let's see, what else does the Dutch contribute? Oh, golf golf, bowling, Easter eggs, all Dutch things that become part of American culture because of New York and the Duke of York here. Uh, so yeah, he expands New York and he does a pretty good job there. Don't worry about Liza's Rebellion, that never comes up. Ah, then Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was founded by William Penn. And this was created as a refuge for Quakers. Quakers were part of, they were once considered a cult, and the Quakers uh, was part of a religion that was officially known as the Society of Friends, which is a pretty cool sounding religion. Now, 
the Quakers were known as Quakers because they would sit in their pews and they would quake when they felt the power of God compel them. They would rise and be like, aha, God has told me that we should farm on Thursdays and not on Fridays. Like, oh, that's a good idea. And they would sit back down and think about God and pray. And as they felt the power of God come inside, they would like shake and like do that. So they were called Quakers derogatively. And then this became like, okay, Quakers is cool. They co-opted the term. Uh, the Quakers believed in a few things. They didn't believe in paying for tax-supported churches. They said, you know what? That's crazy. If you want to go to a church, you can pay for it directly, but they don't believe in tax-supported churches. For example, they don't want to pay for a Catholic church. They're not going to. Also, they're pacifists, which means they did not want to go to war. And that got them in a lot of trouble. Uh, but actually, because of their open trade policies and their freedom of religion, they did practice a lot of freedom of religion. That was their key draw. Uh, the freedom of religion made them very popular. As you can see, uh, their population outgrew all the other three major cities pretty quickly. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, because of that religious toleration. The Quakers, unlike all the other religions, said everyone's welcome, even Jews and atheists. Um, also, they were willing to uh, pay Native Americans for their land, which was pretty uncommon for most others. Also, for the longest time, I did not know what was on that brace. I thought, I, was like, I thought it was a letter M, and the kids were like, who's letter M? I said, I really don't know. It's not a letter M. It's two people shaking hands. And I'm like, oh, that makes so much more sense. It was like, oh, yeah, it is two people shaking hands. I didn't notice that at first. And then my kids pointed it out. I'm like, oh, genius. Good job, guys. Overview of the middle colonies. Um, you already know about them. It's not really need to overview. Oh, you should know their economies, though. Uh, primarily, uh, they grew food. or They're known as the breadbasket of the colonies. Their nickname is the breadbasket of the colonies because they grew wheat for the other two regions. Because again, if the South is producing cash crops that they're selling and not eating, the middle colony's job was to provide for everyone else. So their nickname was the breadbasket because they provided for all the food. Uh, here they are again, providing food and bread. And uh, again, very religiously tolerant, very religiously tolerant, also very diverse, very diverse. You think about New York, New York had Swedish, Dutch, British, and they also welcomed the French, the Germans, the Irish. and so. Of all the colonies, they are the most diverse. They are the most religiously tolerant, the most diverse, um, the most friendly to Native Americans. Don't worry about this so much. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> uh, you should know poor Richard Almanac. So one of the books that you should know was by uh, Ben Franklin, who wrote it under the pen name Poor Richard. Uh, and this was a book of farmer's advice and homely advice. You know, early to bed and early to rise make us a man healthy and wise. Half the truth is often a great lie. I like that. And don't throw stones at your neighbors if your own windows are glass. Fun fact, there was another person that was writing a similar almanac at about the same time. And uh, Ben Franklin did not like that so much. And so what he did was when the books were about to compete, poor, uh, Ben Franklin was a newspaper editor. He owned a newspaper. So what he did was he published an obituary of his competitor, saying that he was dead. <laughs> and then because the guy was dead, uh, people stopped buying his book. And so the guy went, I was like, what? I'm not dead. Look, I'm alive. And he would tell people. And the people were like, dude, that's messed up. Don't pretend to be a dead guy. Because they just assumed that he was dead. And so eventually he was able to prove his name, but by that time, Poor Richard's Almanac became far more popular than the other guys. And so Ben Franklin's kind of a douche. <laughs> also, he would like sleep around a lot, and he would like sleep with his friends' wives when they were gone. And oh, oh yeah, Ben Franklin, crazy. You guys know the story of the, the key and the electricity also? Yeah. I had found this picture, and I thought it was awesome. <laughs> it's like Ben Franklin versus Zeus electricity so there, I have a few of these pictures it's like awesome presidential photos that are very similar to this like yeah exactly like <laughs> shooting electricity with this kite against Zeus himself so it's pictures like this you'll see another one of a uh, I have one of I found one of a uh, the same artist did a series of them for like Paul Revere 
uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, some of the key presidents. It was pretty cool. Um, one of the other key uh, colonists you guys should know is Cotton Mather, Reverend Cotton, Cotton Mather. He created, um, or he promoted smallpox inoculation just to kind of prevent people from dying. So what he would do is that he would find someone who's already afflicted with smallpox, he'd put them on a wagon as they were dying, and then he would take the pus from their boils, oh. take it out of a syringe, and then inject it in other people. Because obviously the pus has already weakened the back, weakened virus. And so the hope was that by giving the pus weakened bacteria, uh, weakened viruses to others, uh, they would survive the smallpox. They would get smallpox, uh, but then it would be a weaker form of it so they could survive it. And so uh, it actually did save a lot of people's lives because as more people got inoculated from the weaker form, they were able to fight off with the new antigen to the stronger form. And, uh, oh, uh, Peter Zenger. You guys should know Peter Zenger also. Z-E-N-G-E-R. Zenger. Uh, he was arrested because he criticized the governor of New York in a newspaper. And back then, uh, he was like, oh, and he was a pretty incompetent governor. And so the governor had him arrested because he criticized them. And the court of New York ruled uh, you can't just arrest someone because you didn't like what they wrote, so it establishes freedom of the press. Cool. So that's the middle colony so far. What we'll do is we'll take a quick break. We'll talk about the first Great Awakening, and then we'll finish off as much as we can until the end. Okay, so let's talk about the Revolutionary Era. No, I'm just kidding. The Great Awakening. Huh? The Great Awakening. <laughs> okay, so uh, one of the other things that's happening during the Colonial Era is the First Great Awakening. I'm not going to spend too much detail on this because this is not an AP US history class. Um, but the First Great Awakening is uh, the beginning of religious revival in America. When people came to America initially, yes, religion was pretty big back in like 1607. But by like the late 1660s, 1670s, religion starts kind of dying out because you have people moving further and further west. I'm sorry, um, 1730s, 1740s. Religion starts dying out. One of the major reasons why religion starts dying out by the 1730s and 40s is that people are moving further and further west. And when you're moving further and further west out into the frontier, the first thing on your mind is not, you know what I should do? I should totally build a church first before I build my home. Okay, fine, I'll build my home first. But after that, I'm going to build a church and not farm food. You know, it, it's, it's, it becomes a, fine, a last priority. So while people are still religious, they're not as religious as they used to be. And so the Great Awakening begins as a religious revival uh, throughout the colonies. <clears throat> Again, like you see religion failing, whatever else. One of the major reasons why religion failed was the Salem witch trials. What led up to uh, the failure of religion once again, people are moving further west, they're moving away from the church, but what else failed was the Salem witch trials. And the biggest problem was that they accused all these women of being witches, you know. Uh, women uh, were accusing uh, men of, you know, putting spells on them and vice versa, when the reality, most of this stuff was just petty. Like, if a woman liked a man, but the man was already married, she might accuse the wife of being a witch. Or like if a man was really, really wealthy and people didn't like him for it, then clearly he was wealthy because of the devil. So stuff like that. It became more like people did not like the inequities of society. People were, unha were unhappy with all the changes. And so if something was weird or you did not like it, if there was jealousy, then the Salem witch trials was a great opportunity to accuse someone of being a witch. In any case, there were all these stories of people being witches. Uh, girls would say, oh, the witch is here and is touching me and I can just feel it. And there was no evidence, but they said that was good enough. Uh, and so a lot of people, I believe 50 women were hung to death. And this was like a, it was like a three month period of just hysteria. At the very end, the churches said, whoa, 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 you guys gotta calm down. And they apologized for it. But the impact of the Salem witch trials was this. If they were wrong about that, and that was a pretty big thing to be wrong about. What else are they wrong about? Are they wrong about predestination? Are they wrong about going to church on Sundays? And so the Salem witch trials pretty much opened that chasm into doubt. 
and because of that, people began to leave the church. They're like, whoa, I can't believe they were wrong about that. What else? And the doubting began. And all you needed was that seed of doubt to really kill the churches at the time. And so a few great men must step up to make society better. And you have the beginning of the first great awakening. And the first great awakening really begins with a few of the new preachers. The new preachers were called the new lights. And the new lights were preachers that used emotion to promote their sermons. Before, sermons were very matter-of-fact, and so God came down to earth and uh, gave everyone sandwiches and all was good. You know, just very plain, very monotone, but you should like it because you're a good Christian. But he realized that, you know, society is changing and you have to win people over. So the New Lights began these very emotional sermons. They were known as Jeremiah's. And Jeremiah's were these deeply emotional sermons. And some of them were very critical. Uh, rather than just saying, you know, things are bad, they would call people out. You! You are a sinner and I know you sin and God will cast you down into hell unless you return to the church. And this became exciting. <laughs> you know, church became interesting all of a sudden. Here is an example of Jonathan Edwards, one of the first New Light preachers. Jonathan Edwards, one of the first New Light preachers. And again, he would call people out for their sins. He would actually make them walk up to the front bench and say, tell everyone of your sins. We already know what they are, so admit them. And people would come to church like, oh my God, are they going to talk about that today? So church became some form of entertainment for some. But others, it was just... It was just pretty interesting to go to church. I mean, it was, you know, you got to hear people's dirty laundry being aired out, but also it was just, the, the, the sermons were pretty fascinating. I think that would make me not want to go to church. If they didn't call you out. But again, part of it was just <laughs> excitement. Uh, the other famous uh, preacher was George Whitefield. He was a very famous preacher as well. And what George Whitefield would do, interestingly, is he was a circuit writer. Um, he was a traveling preacher, so he would travel from city to city giving these sermons, and people just got enthralled by it, excited by it. He would go to places that didn't have churches, and he would just speak out in the woods. So again, uh, yeah, George Whitefield and them changed. Uh, here, here's another picture of uh, Jonathan Edwards. Many people did not like them. They thought that they were the devil. You know, like they were trying to change the church and that they were doing it incorrectly. So they said that the devil was blowing in their ears. But yeah, otherwise, pretty good stuff. A great awakening. So this moves us to uh, the Revolutionary Era. We're going to go ahead and skip the French and Indian War. Let's go straight to the Revolution. So the road to revolution. Uh, quick background. The French-Indian War was a war between the colonists and the uh, French colonists. So the British colonists versus the French colonists. That got out of hand, so the French and the British both end up joining the war. And the British win, the French are kicked out of the North Americas, but it cost the British a lot of money. And so the British say, hey, look, Americans, you cost us a lot of money. We can't have you doing that again, so I'm sorry, but for the last few hundred years, we've let you do whatever you want. That's not going to happen anymore. So the Revolutionary Era is the beginning of the end of something called benign neglect. It's the end of benign neglect. In the past, the British just ignored the colonies, let them govern themselves, do whatever they wanted. But look where it got them. It cost them like $23 billion. And so they said, look, we can't just ignore the colonies anymore because they're prone to getting into fights. So we have to pay attention. We can't just give them freedom. And so the British decide the more important thing to do is to begin controlling the colonists. The colonists are not too happy with that. But the British say, you know what? Too bad. You cost us a war. Or you, yeah, you, you made us pay for a war that we did not want to fight. So we're going to have to control you now. And the colonists will not be too pleased. So one of the first laws that the British pass is the Proclamation Act of 1763. And what the Proclamation Act of 1763 said was this. All of this right here, besides the colonies, so let me make it more clear. All of this right here that I just circled 
is land we won from the French during the French and Indian War. Colonial lives were lost fighting that war. And the British said, with the Proclamation Act of 1763, colonists may not pass or may not expand beyond this proclamation line. So you could not expand on the newly won territories. Colonists may not expand beyond the proclamation line. And the colonists weren't happy about that at all. They were like, what? we just spilled American blood for that. But the British said, look, you cost us a lot of money. And if you continue to expand west, fine. You're not going to run to the French because we just kicked them out. But you know who you will run into? Native Americans. And that's going to cost us a lot of money. So the economic reason why they would not let them expand was they didn't want to have to pay for their defense. They didn't want to start another war. So they said, colonists, I'm sorry, but you're not allowed to expand. You can't go anywhere else. You're staying where you are. The colonists didn't like that. The second thing that they, the re second reason why they did it, they want to control the colonists. And by keeping them in a smaller territory, it's much easier to control them. So again, the colonists are not too happy about the Proclamation Act, and this becomes the first of the oppressive acts. The colonists refer to them as the oppressive acts. I have a question, just like random. How, sure. how long would it take them to find out about these wars since they were across the Atlantic Ocean? So, like, how were the British notes and the troops over? Ah, okay. So, the uh, French and Indian War began in 1754. It didn't end until 1763. So, it was a nine year war. And so, it did last for some time. Like, the, there were actually three phases. Phase one was just colonists versus colonists. Second phase was colonists and the British fighting against the French, but they didn't fight together. They were fighting in separate groups. The third phase was the British and the colonists kind of converged their militaries together. But it did take time, and it would take, what, like three, four weeks just to send the troops over. So it would take some time. So you get word. It takes time to get over there, and then word has to come back as well. I mean, one of the best examples is that in the War of 1812, um, the treaty was signed in December 1814. Andrew Jackson defeated the British in New Orleans in this massive battle in January 1815 because they didn't know the war was over yet. So there's this massive battle that no one knew about uh, that, that happened because they didn't know the, tr the war was over. So without the telegraph, which won't happen for some time, um, there is no instant communication. Maybe you can get to someone in, what, 10 days? The fastest across the country? No, across the country, from, let's say, Missouri to California, the fastest you could do is 10 days. But across the Atlantic Ocean, three weeks, maybe four, takes time. Navigation acts were also introduced at the time. Navigation acts were to, designed to promote mercantilism. Mercantilism. Are you guys familiar with the theory of mercantilism? Okay. The basic idea of mercantilism was that the colonies were only supposed to serve the mother country. The colonies served only the benefit of the mother country. So what this meant was that if the colonies were going to trade goods, they had to trade only with England. They weren't allowed to trade with France or Spain or the Portuguese. They were only allowed to trade with the British. And if they wanted to trade with the French, they had to go to the British England first before they could go to the French. So the idea was the colonists your purpose is not to become economically successful. Your purpose is to serve the mother country. And because the British were neglecting the colonists for such a long time, the colonists were trading with the French. The colonists were trading with the Spanish. And they said, enough of that. You may only trade with us. So that's what happened there. They were also kind of angry because during the French-Indian War, some of the colonists were still trading with the French, even though we were fighting with them. So they weren't too pleased with that. Sugar Act. One of the first acts that were passed that was a direct tax was the Sugar Act, which was a tax on sugar, which is not surprising. The colonists were upset for two reasons. Number one, they were upset because they saw this as taxation without representation. Remember, the colonists were ignored again for a couple decades. And so if the colonists were going to tax someone, the tax had to be passed by their representative government. The House of Burgesses had to tax them. The House of Delegates had to pass, tax them. This was a tax passed by Parliament, and the colonists said, wait a minute. We didn't even get to vote on this. And they would have been fine if they voted and they failed, and they still got taxed, 
so long as they had the right to vote, or at least had the opportunity to vote. But the British said, no, 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 no. We get to tax you whenever we want because we're England and you're a colony. So they didn't like this idea of no taxation without representation. Again, they just wanted a vote. They didn't care if they lost that vote. They just wanted to vote. The other argument, though, was that this tax was being paid. Uh, the tax was used to pay for troops in the colonies. That was the other frustration. The tax was used to pay for troops in the colonies. And the problem the colonists had was that the troops in the colonies were not there for defense anymore. They weren't there to defend the colonists against the French. The troops were there to control the colonists. And so they didn't like that. They felt that, why are we paying a tax that'll pay for troops that will control us? I don't want that. And so again, they were upset about those two things. Yeah, I like this cartoon about the old... Yes, it's the British king drinking his tea and the old British hag encouraging the drinking of tea. Say, like, go ahead and have some tea. And America's like, no, no, we're going to have our tea without sugar because we are a protest. But again, the, the white, the colors, and the imagery used, very, very strong and very, very obvious. But I always liked how cartoons had so much writing back then, just so much writing. Oops. Moving forward. Uh, now, the Sugar Act did include two things as well, the writs of assistance and the vice admiralty court, which were also very hated by the colonists. Because people began to smuggle sugar left and right, the British imposed something called the Writs of Assistance. And the Writs of Assistance allowed the British to search without a warrant. So if they suspected that you had sugar or you were smuggling sugar, they could kick down your door without getting proof and say, oh, I'm going to check your house just in case you had sugar. OK, no sugar? All right, thanks for your time. So imagine just being pulled over randomly one day and say, oh, uh, you might be uh, peddling drugs. I just want to check and see real quick. And that might just be an inconvenience. But back then, they would search through your house, open up all your stuff, and it was kind of an invasion of privacy. But they said, look, we're looking for smugglers. The king said we could do it. Parliament said we could do it. So we're going to. Collins didn't like that. Secondly was vice admiralty courts. If you were caught, then you would be tried by military courts, which were vice admiralty courts. Here's the problem. The military is the judge, jury, and executioner. They went to your house and they found the sugar. But if they didn't and they just didn't like you, then maybe they would plant sugar in your home. And then they would arrest you and say, hey, did we find sugar in your house? Oh yeah, we did. But no, you put it there. No, I didn't. You're going to jail. So again, that was a problem as well. They felt that it wasn't a fair trial. They wanted a jury of their peers, which they were not going to get in a vice admiralty court. So you can see why the colonists were upset. Then there's the Currency Act, which also upset them. Uh, each colony had their own currency. In fact, each bank had their own currency, if you really want to get specific. But colonies had their own currency. And the British said, <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, only countries may produce their own currency. Uh, as far as I remember, Massachusetts, Virginia, and New York were not individual countries. So they said, in order to make sure that you were promoting the English interests, they banned all colonial currency. All colonial currency was banned. And you could only uh, pay with British pounds or British money or gold and silver. So you could only pay with British money or gold and silver. So you had to exchange your money by a certain time. Now, there's a few problems there. Number one, there wasn't enough British money. They didn't print enough. And so the exchange rate was pretty terrible. <coughs> and two, not everyone has gold and silver. That's a very, very rare commodity. And so many people were left with nothing. And so what you see emerging is a bartering economy, which is not very advanced at all. And people began to barter things uh, because there was no money in order for them to trade. So like, I'll give you a cow for your sandwich. And so that happened. Quartering Act, as you guys might know, because the colonists complained and complained and complained about paying taxes, they'd buy. You don't want to pay taxes? Okay. Then you're going to pay an indirect tax. 
You don't have to pay any money, but the British now get to live in your houses. The soldiers, you have to house our soldiers. If you refuse to pay, then we will figure out a way for you to pay, and the British will now have to house themselves in your homes. You will give them a room. You will clothe, shelter them. You will provide and do their laundry. No privacy. But they said, if you're not going to pay a tax, you have to do this. And by the way, the British had a point. They did cause a war. They did cause the British $23 billion. So if you're looking for the British perspective, they're not wrong. They did cost them a lot of money. And again, the whole purpose of a colony was to serve the mother country. So from the British perspective, they weren't doing anything ridiculous. Now, did they maybe overdo it? Yeah. But they had a point. They had to pay. So the British said, fine, you're not going to pay the Sugar Act. How about the Stamp Act? So the Stamp Act was a tax on paper. It was the most hated tax. Because this tax was paid by everybody. Poor, rich, old, young, everyone had to pay this tax. What it meant was that for every piece of paper or for every document, it had to have a tax to show that you paid to receive that document if it was on paper. Death certificates, birth certificates, playing cards, books, newspapers, deeds, wills, anything that was a printed document had to have a tax. And so what people would do is that the tax, the stamp was on the left, that would prove that you paid the stamp, that paid the tax. On the right then is where they would say, okay, fine, if you're gonna put that stamp, put it right here in a skull and crossbones because that's what it represents. So newspapers would have this section where you would have to put the stamp because it was gonna represent what the stamp tax meant. So this is their form of protest. Many people began to hate what was going on so you see the beginning of the Sons of Liberty. The Sons of Liberty is pretty, uh, it's, labeled a terrorist organization to some degree by the British because they did terrorize. The goal was to try to harass uh, all tax collectors and again to fight for American rights. So the Sons of Liberty. Two key Sons of Liberty leaders were Paul Revere and Samuel Adams. These were the leaders of the Sons of Liberty. Uh, one of the things that they would do was they would uh, tar and feather. Uh, the tax collectors if they could, or the customs officials. Pretty important stuff. Uh, one really good uh, HBO miniseries, if you guys haven't seen it already, is John Adams. Have you guys seen John Adams? Spectacular. Very, very good. John Adams on the HBO miniseries, HBO miniseries John Adams is very good. It only covers John Adams' life, but there are clips that you can cut that just show your kids. And one of those is Tar and Feathering. When you talk about tar and feathering, uh, you always kids always assume that it's funny. Like you watch like Looney Tunes from way back when, and like you know you you dump you no know, oil on someone and you put feathers and look like a chicken. It's like ha ha ha, really funny, but it's not. It's horrible. Uh, and so, do I have it here? I hope I have it here. If I don't, that makes me sad. Um, no, I don't have it here at the moment. I just changed computers. Oh, maybe I do. Hold on. Sound, but you can hear the sound. It just won't be very loud. I put the forty-eight thirty-seven. So you're going to see John Adams uh, speaking to Samuel Adams. So what do you think, Mr. Hancock requires of me? You'd like your advice. He's in need of legal advice. I will speak to. So the guy on the left is. The guy on the right is John Adams. So, really, you're just going to show what tar and feathering is. Justin, their holes full of tea. 
all British ships. The king demands their cargo be unloaded. Cargo in which we, the citizens of Boston, must pay new tax. Subject to arrest! You will not blast this cargo, gentlemen! This is legitimate cargo. Tea from the East India Company that you are bound by law to unload. What's legitimate about it, friend? No other tea is allowed in Boston Harbor. Either we drink the king's bowl brew or nothing at all. And who may you be, sir? John Hancock, ship owner. Not John Hancock, smuggler. Watch your word, sir. I'm an honest man being strangled by Monopoly. Shame on you, sir. Shame on you is a big deal. So, my kids joke around nowadays. They're like, shame on you. Like, <gasps> shocking. So. So he's a British tax collector and they're gonna tar and feather him. Imagine melting a tire down. Oh no, it's not done. So that's tar and feathering, and so it's not as happy as people assume it to be or remember it to be. Ah, ah. So they're, I mean, they're just gonna parade him around this town as a humiliated. Now the horrible thing is that one, um, again, imagine melting a tire down in a cauldron and how hot that would have to be. You put that all over yourself, so you're talking about third degree burns all over. Luckily, likely your skin will start boiling and pussing just because it's infected and destroyed. At which point then you have to remove the tar once it hardens. And so then the secondary problem is that you have to remove it and it will tear your skin off. Uh, tar and feathering was a horrible, horrible experience. Um, in fact, most of those people will be scarred for life as a result of that. Because imagine just like getting a third degree burn on your skin, just like from, you know, hot water. Are there any deaths? Some people died of shock, just because it is this horrible, horrible experience. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, it's, we think about it today like it was really funny and cute, but no, it was horrible. I mean, this is why, I mean, even today, if the Sons of Liberty existed today, you would label them terrorists because they were, I mean, for a more modern view, terrorist organization. Um, now, were they freedom fighters? Sure, of course they were, but just like the Afghan and Taliban were as well, they were freedom fighters. So it's not, I mean, it's great, also pretty horrible. I mean, there's just a lot of ways to look at it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Paul Revere, and then again, in this scene, I mean, you'd have them force them drink, like, their horrible tea once they finished tar and feathering them. So there was even more stuff, and people laughed, and people were angry, and so they thought, you know, the, I, it's okay to push my frustrations on you. But I mean, in retrospect, you look at it, and like, holy crap, that is just not okay. And so you ask your kids, you know, so I like the quote that John Adams says at the very end, is that, do you approve of this, a, uh, a brutal act uh, for, uh, to fight for a political principle? Is that justified to torture and brutalize someone to fight for political, political principle? 
and John, Samuel Adams can't respond, uh, but it's something to ask your kids. I mean, like, is it okay? I mean, do the ends justify the means? You know, Machiavelli and the Prince. You know, is it okay to torture someone if it means that you're fighting for your rights? You know, to what ends will you go? So in any case, uh, here's an example of Paul Revere, Son of Liberty. <laughs> Pretty awesome. I like to think, I mean, again, this is probably more appropriate uh, when the British are coming, so I'll probably change the slide later. Um, but here he is trying to get to warn the rest of the colonists that the British are coming. In any case, here are the Sons of Liberty, again, kind of promoting walking through the streets kind of thing. Declaratory Act, uh, so you don't really have to worry about this one so much, but the Declaratory Act uh, was a face-saving act for the British where they repealed the Sugar Act. It was so unpopular. And uh, what, the, what the colonists did to kind of fight back against the Stamp Act, rather, uh, was they boycotted British goods. And the boycott did actually work. The boycott was effective against the British, and so their economy was somewhat suffering. And so many British merchants complained that the colonists were not buying their goods. So the British said, okay, fine, we'll repeal the Stamp Act. But not because the boycott was effective. We're repealing it because we want to repeal it. And they made it clear in the Declaratory Act, we can tax you without permission whenever we want. So they just want to like reinforce their authority. Look, we're not repealing it because you told us to. We're repealing it because we want. And just so you know, we don't have to ask for permission. We can do it because we're the British government. Um, then there's a Townsend Act. The Townsend Act was, again, further taxes on the colonies. Uh, this was, again, on paper, glass, sugar, tea, lead, paint. A lot of taxes, again, on this stuff. Again, we want them to pay the taxes, and here they are marching them into the to hell. Pay the taxes. Walk into hell. Don't worry about John Dickinson. And so in protest, you see the Boston Massacre. People are pretty angry. They're pretty upset. Uh, and so the Boston Massacre happens, and... Uh, they argue that the British intentionally fired on the colonists, which is not true. Um, it was an accident. But the Sons of Liberty are really excited about this. They're like, yes. Because now they can use this propaganda. The British killed Americans. And so you see the beginning of a propaganda war against the British. Uh, Samuel Adams is actually the person that drew this and spreads throughout the country this idea of a Boston massacre. It wasn't a massacre. Eight people died. I mean, yes, it's a lot, but it's not a massacre by any by any standard. Uh, but people died, and so you begin the Boston Massacre. And again, it's used as propaganda against the British, um, and they spread the story around through what become known as the oops, as the uh, committees of correspondence. And the committees of correspondence, I like to allude as being like uh, the Facebook or the Twitter for the revolutionaries or the Sons of Liberty, it was their communication network. And so the way they would kind of spread news of British atrocities was through the committees of correspondence. You know, they would send stories of what the British were doing here and what the British were doing there through the committees of correspondence. So again, it's very similar to Facebook or like a status update. British just killed eight. And then you would read about the story. So they would ride horse to horse, that kind of thing. Because they couldn't do it by mail because the British were watching the mail. So they had to have a guy on a horse travel from city to city spreading the stories of what was happening. Well, again, people are pretty upset about the Townsend Act, so they repeal all of them except for the Tea Act, as you guys know. And the Tea Act happens. And the Tea Act, uh, which people are angry about, is a tax on tea, which results in the Boston Tea Party. Well, people just dump tea dressed as Native Americans all over Boston Harbor. Uh, fun fact, uh, they dressed up as Native Americans to fool the British to make them think that Native Americans were doing it, but they weren't fooling anybody because there was a crowd watching them do it. I mean, clearly these were white people dressed up as Native Americans. Um, but yeah, they dumped 492 chests of tea into Boston Harbor. It'll cost the British like $30 million. It's pretty expensive. And so the British, again, are pretty pissed. I mean, for good reason. That's like if, again, you know, the Taliban go in and they start destroying, like, American tanks. Yes, we are angry if you did that today as well. If you destroy a Walmart in protest, that's not okay. And so the British respond with the coercive or intolerable acts. The coercive or intolerable acts. 
which pretty much does three things. It shuts down Boston Port. It shuts down Boston government until they can repay the Tea Party debt. So I guess it shuts down Boston port and government until they can repay their Boston Tea Party debt, which is like 30 million, which is going to be difficult to do if you shut down Boston port because they can't trade. This cartoon is a really good job illustrating how the colonists felt, though. I mean, on the left side is a man with a sword that says military law, and that woman in the center is the Bostonians, or their freedom, and the scene of her pretty much getting raped, his idea. And they're pouring, you know, the tea down her throat, they're looking down her dress, the British are just laughing, and in the back you see Columbia, the spirit of freedom, just like ashamed of what's happening. And it pretty much gets the story across. Political cartoons are the best. If you don't use them enough, you should, because they do a fantastic job illustrating the point of view at that time. And it allows the students to do um, primary source uh, analysis. You just put it up on a slide and say, so how do you think they felt? What do you see? Prove it. It's a really good idea of just being able to con you know, convince them what's happening. And if you need them to, you know, to explain kind of what's happening, you know, what does bitter drought mean? You know, who was the able doctor that they're talking about? What do you see? Especially for English language learners, using the visuals to help explain what's happening. Uh, this is a really good way to do it. One last straw is the Quebec Act. This is kind of like a slap to the face. The Quebec Act, uh, again, all controlled by the British now by this time after the French Indian War. Uh, the Quebec Act gave the Canadians religious freedom and self-government. So while the colonists are losing their rights, we give the Quebecois and the Canadians more rights. And the Americans felt like, wait, what? The guys that we just defeated, you're giving them rights while you're taking ours away? Uh, that's not cool at all. They're pretty upset about that. So that happens. That's the Quebec Act. Oh, let's uh, discard that. And then, so they're angry. So it's going to take us actually to the war itself. Let's get to the actual American Revolution. Nope. The American Revolution is take us very quick. Do you actually have to know very little of it at all? Um, and so you have the first Continental Congress that forms. And the First Continental Congress meets, and they hope to end the war, but not seek independence. So understand, when the revolution first broke out, the First Continental Congress did not want to declare independence. All they wanted well, was just happiness. They just wanted benign neglect back. They just wanted independence. They just wanted freedoms and rights. They were willing to remain part of the British Empire. They just wanted benign neglect. The problem was the British weren't going to give that to them. And so war finally does break out, and you have the famous Battle of Lexington and Concord, uh, and where the British, uh, or rather, rather Paul Revere makes his famous ride to, uh, I don't know, warn them that the British were coming. So you have the famous one if by land, two if by sea, lanterns of Old Trinity Church. And Paul Revere makes his famous midnight ride as uh, stated by uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Fun fact, first off, Paul Revere looks a lot like Jack Black. <laughs> he does look a lot he like does. Jack Black. Also, he never finished his midnight ride. He actually made his midnight ride with two others, Samuel Prescott and William Dawes. And the three went on a famous midnight ride. Also, they did not go screaming down the towns, the British are coming, the British are coming, for two reasons. Number one, they're spies, and there are British soldiers already in the city. They can't go around screaming at the top of the lungs, the British are coming, because they'll be captured. So they're quietly running through the town, knocking on doors. The British are coming. Get ready. So there's that. Secondly, they're not going to say the British are coming because they're British. That doesn't make sense. That's like me saying the Californians are coming. The Californians are coming. But I'm a Californian. They would have likely said the Redcoats are coming 
or the regulars are coming. The regulars mean the regular army, not the militia. So uh, they tend to get this wrong a lot. They did not say the British are coming. It's either the redcoats or the, uh, the regulars are coming. So make sure your kids are told that because likely their eighth grade teachers have told them it incorrectly by this time. So they make their midnight run. And also you should know that Paul Revere did not finish because he was arrested at a tavern where he had stopped to get a drink. <laughs> the rest of the charge was finished by Samuel Prescott, as you can see here, finishing the midnight ride through Lexington and Concord. So that by the time the British arrive, uh, by the way, this is when the British were trying to take away their guns. And this is where the argument for the Second Amendment um, they were ready. And you have the Battle of Lexington and Concord. And they're like, oh crap, blood has been spilled. It's going to be really hard to turn away. But they still try to. They're still hoping that they can have peace, you know, without victory. They're hopefully that we can have peace without, you know, declaring independence, getting our rights back. Uh, but they are aware that you know blood has been spilled and we do have to defend ourselves so they do decide to declare George Washington to be the general of the Continental Army. This was a smart choice. Primarily because one, we do have to defend ourselves. But choosing George Washington was not done for, done for just you know, basic reasons. Number one, George Washington was well respected by everyone. And he was a plantation owner. So it was a wealthy man willing to fight the war for you know, the commoners as well. So he was well respected by the rich and the poor because he was a common aristocrat. You should know, George Washington was not born rich. He was married into wealth when he married Martha Washington. So he inherited her wealth. But he was a commoner that became an aristocrat, which meant everyone got him. Everyone understood George Washington. The commoners liked him, but he was also a well-respected wealthy man now. So he was liked by all classes. But more importantly, he was a unifying figure. Because up until this point, all the fighting has been fought in Boston. And so many of the other colonies said, well, this is a northern war. This is not a problem of the south. George Washington was from Virginia, which meant this was a southerner who was going to fight for the northerners, which showed that this was not a problem of the north. This was a problem of all colonies. So George Washington was a unifying figure because he was a Virginian fighting in a northern war. Smart, brilliant idea. Again, he always walked around with a black band around his arm to show that you know, he was mourning the loss of his fellow Americans. They thought, wow, this is a guy that's, that gets it. So they appointed him general. He makes some famous, uh, famous attacks. Uh, one of the more famous ones is the Battle of Trenton, where he attacks, uh, he makes that famous cross uh, across the icy waters of the Delaware, and he surprise attacks the... Uh, German mercenaries. They're called Hessians. And he attacks them on Christmas night. They're like, what? It's Christmas. And he's like, I don't care. It's Christmas. And so he makes a surprise attack crossing the Delaware here. Bold. Amazing. Proud. Um... You should also note uh, that one of the major reasons why the Americans begin to uh, break away is because of the writings by this man, Thomas Paine, P-A-I-N-E. You can abbreviate his name, T-Paine. Just <laughs> don't get the kids excited. But T-Paine here writes a pamphlet called Common Sense, which, again, promotes independence. Because at this point, we're not growing independent. We're not declaring independence yet, but we're moving towards it. One of the major reasons is this man, Thomas Paine. Uh, and Thomas Paine writes a book called, again, uh, Common Sense, which says it doesn't make sense that a small island should control such a large continent. It doesn't make sense that a king should govern a democracy. It doesn't make sense that someone 3,000 miles away gets to tell us what to do. It's pretty good. It's common sense that we should break away. So he writes very wonderfully in this book, Common Sense. Um, one of the major reasons why we declare war, though, is people have already died. And so if you think about it, people have died, and we can't say, these people died, so we could go back to just being ruled by the British again. They had to have died for something. 
And so you start seeing this argument for what did they die for? Well, they died for independence. You can't die for being governed under the British crown. You have to die for independence. So there's this argument for what did they die for? And so on June 2nd, 1776, Henry Richard Lee, he uh, motions for independence from Virginia. And they're like, independence? You can't have independence. There's this huge ruckus, this huge debate about whether or not this is uh, going to happen. And many of them said, this is what we deserve. We deserve independence. We want to be free from the British crown. And yet there are those that fight and say, no, we can't have independence. And one of the biggest fears is a delegate from Pennsylvania that says, you don't understand what you're doing. If we declare independence, there is nothing stopping the British from killing all of us. You really want to open that door? Right now, the only thing keeping the British war machine back is the decency that they cannot kill their own people. But if we declare independence, who will come and help us? We have no guns. We have no navy. We have no army. One of the famous quotes that I like them using is that, we'll be in a storm on a skiff made of paper. And we're going to be destroyed by the British, and no one's going to come and help us. And so he makes this, this huge plea. And this is, a, this is a Pennsylvania Quaker that is afraid of war, but he makes a good point. Who will come to our aid? And they say, the French. The French? The French? You dare us. No, don't shake off the yoke of the British only to become fresh citizens. They're like, no, 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 the French will understand. They will be our ally, not our rulers. And But again, the argument breaks out in the constitutional, uh, in the, the, the second uh, constitutional, no, second continental congress. And again, debate breaks out. Are we going to be free? Are we going to become, you know, part of another French empire? John Adams does a fantastic job, again, showing the debates and the speeches made between the different groups. So again, even if you're not going to show it in your class, I highly recommend watching John Adams just so you have a better understanding of what happened because he does a great job doing this. In any case, on July 2nd, 1776, the Declaration of Independence is read out to the world, to the people. It's read on July 4th, though. But we were already independent by that time. And people ask, why did we write the Declaration of Independence? Because it wasn't for the American people. We know why we were declaring independence. We were angry. You know, our rights were being taken away. It wasn't for the British. They understood why also. We've been explaining to them for years. The Declaration of Independence was written to the world to show why we were declaring independence in the hopes that they would come and help us. The Declaration of Independence was written so we could seek aid from other European countries. Now, uh, one technique I really like to use in my lecture once I introduce the Declaration of Independence is I have a PowerPoint here for the Declaration of Independence. Is it here? This one? Oops, this card. Um, And it works really well to the soundtrack of Inception. I'm all about theater in my classroom. I'm all about just making it as dramatic as possible. Um, and so let's see if I, if I don't know if I have the Inception soundtrack on this computer. Um, I might have it on my phone. But you play it, and it works so well. Um, I'll do it for you guys next week, so I'll have the speakers also. Um, but you read the Declaration of Independence uh, just with visuals and with music behind it, and you just read it with as much emotion as you can. And you read it, and the kids are just like, oh my god, this is just the most amazing thing. In my classroom, the things I'm most noted for at the end of the year, I'll always ask them, so what did you like best about the class? It's the theatrics. You know, because again, we always argue that history is dead. So make it come alive. I mean, no, no, just tell it with the passion. No, I mean, again, even what I do with you guys, I don't just say, well, you know, the guy said that we would die. No, you, you say it as if you were as scared as they were. Like, you know, do you really want to go to war? Because if we do, we'll be in a storm on a skiff made of paper. And you're like, oh, I get it. I get it. But you want to make your class as theatric as possible, if you can, because it really will sell it to the kids. You're competing with... YouTube and you know the MTV and iPods if you want to capture their attention 
you have to be just as entering as dramatic as you know they're seeing on television. You have to. And it's fun. It really is just fun. I mean, put on costumes. I don't have costumes so much, uh, but I don't feel like I need to. I feel like I can use the theater of just like acting just to sell those more important stories. And yet, is most of your class still going to be lecture? Sure. You're going to have, you know, Socratic seminars and activities and whatever else. But the information and the passion still has to come from you as a teacher. You still have to make them believe that this is important. You still have to make them believe that when decisions were being made about the Declaration of Independence, it wasn't just some people reading documents like, yeah, okay, I'll sign this. No, it was, there were decisions about your livelihoods. Your families were dying. Villages were being pillaged and women were being raped. I mean, what is going to happen? Are you going to stand by and let this happen? I love speaking in first person. And so it gets confusing sometimes when you're talking about five or seven different people. But if you speak in first person, you then can argue that I'm talking to you as colonists. I'm not talking to you as students. By saying they, they, and then they did this and they did this, it doesn't feel alive to them. Talk to them as if you were sitting in a constitutional convention. Now, what would you do if your lives were being, you know, were being destroyed and your money was being taken? What would you do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to declare independence. And so what they tell us, what they want from us, we're not going to let them have. Like, oh, he's talking about the British. I get it. <laughs> but it really does help. You know, because, I mean, everything else we read is pretty dry. Everything else is pretty safe. Don't be safe. You know, challenge them. You know, even if you're going to do something controversial, that's okay so long as you present both sides. I always do. Because I will then say, you know what, but if I was a British man, I would say, well, who are you to tell me that I can't tax you? You just cost me $23 billion. Unless I remind you, you are a colony. And your purpose when we created you back in 1600 was to serve the British, not to cost me money. So get angry. Always get angry. Always laugh. Always get to that sincere, almost evil sense of these colonists will take them for everything that they have. Have those side conversations. Set up a scene in a smoky room in the back of the palace. King George sat down, spanned in his fist, and said, we're going to take them for everything. Dramatize it. Because it's more interesting that way. And it's also, it's more fun for you as a teacher. Because even, in, I mean, there are parts of history that are just boring. I mean, I, even I hate to. I'm like, oh my god, I have to teach this? So make it fun. Dramatize it. Use music. I even tried at some point. I bought a light for my classroom with a remote. Uh, that would change color. So like, if I wanted to make things more dramatic, I had a light from like, like red, it'd be like wartime, it'd be like war. <laughs> economics green. It wasn't as good as I thought it was, but again, like it's those things where you're constantly having to think of, how can I sell this to the kids? You're, that's what you're doing, you're selling history. Because remember, the best way I like to put it is the kids have one chance at US history, at good US history, that's gonna be you. So if they leave your classroom not liking it or not getting it, that's one other American that we failed. And they're going to go into this world debating about gun rights and not getting why they are or are not constitutional. You're just going to say, guns are good or guns are bad. Why? Because. And that's not good enough. It's just not. You know, you guys have a responsibility. So for me, the reason why I like teaching this class is for speeches like this. This is why you're supposed to teach. Not because it's fun and, you know, the kids should know history. No, because it's important. They have to get it. They have to understand why the Second Amendment was important back then. But they also have to understand, once you get further onto history, why maybe the Constitution has to change from time to time. And is today, and you bring up contemporary debates, is today one of those times in which the Constitution is supposed to represent the period when we fought against the British? Is it that time again? Or is this a time in which we intended in 1789 when the Constitution was supposed to change when times changed? But you let them decide, but you make sure that they care enough to want to decide. Let's uh, finish off and get to our independence. this one. So we fight the war. We fight a war that deserves fighting. Uh, the British Empire, pros and cons, American colonists, pros and cons. Uh, one of the benefits of fighting for the American colonists, one of their advantages, the most important one, is they fought guerrilla war. Guerrilla warfare. Again, you always joke with your kids. Guerrilla, not like G O R, but G U R R I L L A. And then guerrilla warfare, though, is interesting because guerrilla is just English, I mean, Spanish and French for war. So it's warlike warfare. 
guerrilla warfare just means warlike warfare, which makes no sense whatsoever. It's like guerrilla warfare means warlike warfare, but what they mean is like you don't fight in straight lines, which the British were still doing. America said we're not going to beat that, so hide behind trees because that's that's smart. That's not stupid. So I tell my kids, if I was going to fight you, there's like 30 of you. There's no way I would beat you. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to shoot you and I'm going to hide behind the cabinet. And I'm going to knock that down. I'm going to shoot you and I'm going to run behind my desk. I'm going to shoot you again. I'm going to run inside my classroom. No, I'm going to keep on doing these things. But you can't use shooting anymore. So like, I'm going to hit you with a rock and I'm going to run. I'm going to hit you with another <laughs> rock and I'm going to run. So as society and times have changed and, you know, shooting guns have been a little bit more not PC, then you update just slightly. But the concept is still there. I'm going to throw a rock at you and I'm going to run. I'm going to throw a rocket jam and I'm going to run. I'm going to throw a rocket jam and I'm going to run. Because I can't feed all of you. But at the very end, I'll narrow you down. I'll get to you. The British advantage? They have unlimited finances. They can continue fighting this war as long as they want. So for the Americans, it's a war of attrition. Can we keep on fighting until the British just don't want to fight anymore? The Vietnamese are the same thing. They learned from us. Let's just fight until they don't want to fight anymore. Because we're at home turf advantage. The Vietnamese are the same thing. I mean, you can't blame them. It worked. Here are all the battles. A lot of battles fought. Uh, Lexington and Concord. You guys should know is the first battles. So you guys already know that though. Battle Lexington and Concord was the first. Hmm? Where, where I Lexington and Concord. Oh, there you uh, go. Yeah. Okay, sorry. All right. Oops. Right there. So Boston and Bunker Hill. Also, Battle Bunker Hill not fought on Bunker Hill. Fought on Breed's Hill. But uh. We named it incorrectly. We fought on the wrong hill. That's also where you see the very famous don't fire and see the whites of their eyes. They were running out of... They were actually going to win that battle had they had more gunpowder, but they ran out. So they said, okay, we're going to conserve as much as we can, so don't fire and see the whites of their eyes. So just shoot when they're really close. Because guns were very inaccurate. Like, I would, like, shoot straight and go, like, in the corner. Uh, the other key battle you should know is the Battle of Saratoga. The Battle of Saratoga. The Battle of Saratoga is important because this is a turning point of the war. The Battle of Saratoga is a turning point of the war. And pretty much what happened, here it is, Saratoga. Uh, what happened in the Battle of Saratoga was that because we won, the French joined the war. Because they thought, the Americans might actually win this. Okay, fine, we will lend you our navy, we will lend you our troops. So the Battle of Saratoga convinced the French to help, which we needed. The last battle you guys have to know is the Battle of Yorktown. The Battle of Yorktown is when the uh, British surrendered. And that's the end of the war. I don't teach military history because you really don't have to. Some teachers do because they like it. I'm not a particular fan of military history. I think that what happens and the experiences of it are important. But in and of itself, battles are just battles. I like talking about the aftermath the lives during the impacts after but I think the rest of history is far more interesting than just this battle happened this battle happened and so uh, in the Treaty of Paris that we signed uh, they give us this territory called the Northwest Territory so pretty much the basic idea is we're gonna give them all this land the British are gonna give us all this land in the hopes that we can expand and we won't want more land in the future. And America's like, oh yeah, that's actually good. That's actually good enough land for us because we are gonna expand. And you're right, we don't wanna go to war with you in the future. So good idea, British. Thank you for giving us all this land. Uh, that won't be good for us for very long. So that's uh, the American Revolution. Questions about it? Good. Is most of that stuff reviewed and you guys learned a few th new things there? Yeah. Uh, we don't really have enough time to start the next unit because it's going to be Washington. Uh, so here's my question. Really, this is only three sessions, and you can only get to about two units per, se per session that we have just because there's just a lot you have to cover. Unlike the other one where we can go into a little bit of detail and it's good. Um, and so I can just keep on going chronologically and just continue where we left off each time, or I can jump around. Do you guys want to go chronologically? or Because technically, we should have got up to the Civil War for this section, which, because again, it's, it's here to the Civil War. The next session should be Reconstruction through about the 1920s, and after that should be 1920s until modern day. 
So do you want me to stick to that or just try to get as much as we can chronologically? Well, I feel like maybe jumping around mm -hmm. just so we get a little bit of everything. key points from like everything. Sure. So the next section then what I'll do is I will touch a little bit on just the founding sections. Um, I, I won't go into all the detail, but I will talk about the beginning administrations, Jefferson, Washington, Adams, because I do feel like those are important. And then we'll jump through a little bit of Jackson, we'll jump into the 1920s, that kind of thing as well. But yeah, we'll try to hit everything we can. That way, there's a little bit of everything. But definitely read that book I sent you guys a link to, because that book is fantastic. And again, if you don't want to read it on your computer, you can always buy it online uh, for about 17 bucks from the website. But yeah. Thanks, you guys, for coming. Oh, let me give you guys some documents real quick for this section. Uh, this is just about the Great Awakening. So that's good stuff there. These are some documents about uh, the American uh, the colonial era. We haven't gotten to this yet, but this is about Hamilton and Jefferson. It's actually a pretty interesting read about Hamilton and Jefferson, about their lives. And this is a charter of Rhode Island, kind of just what it meant uh, to have rights as a colony and what those rights looked like. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on Wednesday and we'll continue with history. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. I know I had an issue getting in.